It's unfortunate that we hear so many cases of parents killing their children for so many wild reasons such as them going into a psychosis, them feeling stressed or overwhelmed. Or sometimes it happens when a family is splitting up and one of the parents feels the need to exert their control over the rest of the family. But in today's case, we're going to hear about a level of violence and disturbing behavior from one parent who decides to hurt their child. And even years after it happened, we are still left with so, so many questions about a motive. We don't know exactly why she did this to her own child. And when you hear the level of violence this case reached and the lengths this woman went to, you are going to be sick to your stomach knowing that we really don't even know why she did this. But before we get into the case, I do want to say a huge thank you to AG1 for partnering with me on today's video. Making healthy habits a part of my everyday routine is so important to me, and that is why I use AG1. AG1 is a daily foundational nutrition supplement that helps support the whole body health, elevating your baseline health by supporting the essential and universal needs our bodies need to thrive each day. AG1 contains rhodiola, magnesium, and B vitamins, all which help to improve focus and energy without that crash you get from caffeine. It helps to improve my overall mood and stress levels with their powerful plant extracts, adaptogenic herbs, and antioxidants to help support your metabolism. AG1 works as an immune defense, promotes a healthy gut, and it contains a broad spectrum of micronutrients and phytonutrients to keep your body nourished all day, every day. It is gluten-free, dairy-free, paleo, vegan, and keto-friendly, and it contains only one gram of naturally occurring sugar per serving. I drink my AG1 every morning before I eat my breakfast. I drink it while I'm taking my dogs out and enjoying the morning in the yard. I like that it has a very subtle flavor. It's kind of sweet and earthy, which makes it very easy to drink first thing in the morning. Ever since I started using AG1, I wake up each morning feeling confident that I'm doing what I need to keep up with my healthy living. It's especially nice to have their single serving packets with me when I travel because I don't know about you, but for me, it's so easy to slip into unhealthy habits when I'm surrounded by new restaurants, fast food, and honestly, when you're just kind of tired from traveling. So when I'm that tired, I just turn to whatever's there and usually whatever's there is junk food and snacks. AG1 makes me feel that much more confident that I'm still getting my nutrition even when I'm not tracking my food like I do at home. The best part is that AG1 is trustworthy and transparent. They are backed by multiple research studies doing the legwork to make sure their formulas work so that you don't have to. In one study, they found that 97% of participants felt more energy after 30 days of use. I know that personally, I feel much more energetic each day, I can focus on my work better, and I just overall feel better. Take control of your health now and get started with AG1. Head to drinkag1.com slash Rachel Shannon or scan the QR code to get a one-year supply of vitamin D3 plus K2 and five AG1 travel packs with your first subscription. Thank you again so much to AG1 for partnering with me on today's video. With that being said, let's get into the case. Today, we're going to be discussing the horrific case of Ramsey Scrivo. Also, quick shout out to Michael from Patreon for suggesting this wild case to me. Ramsey Scrivo was born in 1981 to parents Donna and Daniel Scrivo, and he had one older brother, James. Now, Donna was actually working at a prison when she met Daniel. At the time, Daniel was serving a three-year sentence for armed robbery, but in the course of them meeting and getting to know each other, Donna fell in love with Daniel. By the time Daniel was released from prison, the two started a relationship, and shortly after, they were married. After marrying, they moved from their home state of Texas to St. Clair Shores, Michigan, where they settled down. Daniel started his own painting business in Michigan, which was so successful that by the time Ramsey and his brother were born, Donna was able to be a stay-at-home mother, at least while the boys were still young. However, after their youngest son, Ramsey, started school, Donna decided to go back to school to become a registered nurse. She worked part-time at St. John's Hospital in Detroit so she could make some money while still spending time with her children when she could. By all accounts, Donna appeared to be a loving mother who cared about her boys and their success in their lives. She sent her sons to an all-boys Catholic school where they were expected to be on their best behavior and get the best grades possible. 
After Ramsey finished high school, he went off to Wayne State University, graduating in 1999. For the years that followed, Ramsey worked for a few different accounting firms. Eventually, though, he did leave this field after him and one of his bosses got into a disagreement about how to do their job. After that, he started doing various jobs in construction, he worked with an insurance company, but he did eventually start working with his dad at his painting business. This wasn't something that Donna was too fond of. She wanted Ramsey to be doing his own thing. She wanted him to be successful on his own. But for Ramsey, it was a good opportunity. He liked working with his dad and he liked the work he was doing. However, things in Ramsey's life started to change when he was just 29 years old. We don't know the exact details of this, at least from what I've been able to find, but there was one night where Ramsey was out with friends and he fell and hit his head on the concrete. That accident landed him in the hospital with a head injury. After that injury, those around him noticed that his personality changed. He was irritable, he could get angry very quickly, and he would frequently have disagreements with people in his life and at work. He was getting pretty difficult for others to be around. But his injury didn't mean that Ramsey couldn't still live a successful life. After starting work with his dad, Ramsey moved out of the family home and got his own condo nearby. At the time, he was making money from work, but he was also getting disability payments from his head injury. He was able to take care of himself, so despite the head injury, things seemed to be going pretty well for Ramsey. But the entire family was hit with a devastating blow in early 2013. Now, Daniel, Ramsey's father, had been battling with hepatitis C from drug use when he was in his 20s. Some people who contract hep C can recover, but many people will still suffer from long-term chronic hepatitis C where the virus stays in their body forever, causing damage mostly to their liver throughout their life. Most people with chronic hep C can live a normal life, but they will have to get ongoing testing, treatments, and be very careful when it comes to alcohol and anything else that can damage your liver. So even though Daniel lived for over 30 years with the virus, by the time he hit his late 50s, the effects of his illness were catching up to him. His symptoms were getting so bad that he transitioned to palliative care. This meant that the doctors were treating him for pain management and making him more comfortable, which was their main goal, but they were still giving him medications he needed to see if he could still get better. He spent 12 days in the hospital before returning home. At home, Donna continued to take care of him since she was a nurse. She was administering him with different medications he needed to help treat his symptoms. Only one day after being discharged, unfortunately, Daniel passed away. After Daniel passed, the medical examiner did come to the home to examine him and confirm the details of his death. At that time, it was said that after Donna gave Daniel an injection, the site became infected and he died due to sepsis. The reports on what exactly she told the ME were different though, with some saying that she gave him morphine to make him more comfortable. Others said it was a vitamin B12 shot to help treat the overall illness. However, at the home, when the ME was looking into the details of everything, the ME noticed that there appeared to be a vial of morphine missing. The ME asked Donna about this, so she pulled him aside and she told him about Ramsey's head injury, saying that he may have been the one to take it. Otherwise, she didn't have any explanation for what could have happened to the missing morphine. It could be a mistake, a miscount, if anything. However, after hearing that his mom was accusing him of possibly stealing the morphine, Ramsey went ballistic. He started yelling and screaming and started accusing Donna of purposely killing Daniel with the morphine. He said that she was the one who took the morphine, and he said over and over and over again that she killed his father with it. Also, during this argument, it was reported that Ramsey threatened to take his own life by hanging himself. Of course, Ramsey was dealing with a lot at that time. His father had just died, and now there was a question of what happened to this missing morphine. Both Ramsey and Donna pointed the fingers squarely at each other, both of them denying that it was them. But Ramsey was also known to have mental health issues. He was known to be quick to anger. 
Donna said that him blowing up like that and accusing her was really just a part of his mental illness. After this heated argument, Ramsey was admitted to the hospital for a psych evaluation. A toxicology screen did show that he had no morphine in his system. That proved that he at least didn't use the morphine, but obviously no one can say for sure if he took it or not. Ramsey was then released from the hospital after this evaluation. After being released from the hospital, Donna went to court to argue that Ramsey had suffered from this head injury that resulted in a severe mental illness, so therefore, he couldn't care for himself. He was suicidal, constantly making threats and showing clear behaviors that he was a danger to himself. Some sources stated that it was also argued that Ramsey attempted suicide at one point, Donna argued that she was the best person to take care of him given that he was her son and she was a medical provider who was experienced with caring for patients with such needs. Due to this, the courts agreed with Donna and granted her legal custody of Ramsey for the time being. She would be his 24-7 caretaker. After this, Ramsey was back at home living with his mother. This was not something he was happy about. When he got the condo for himself, he was happy to be living independently. His mom had always been really strict with him growing up, so him being in his own condo was definitely like a fresh start where he didn't have to worry about his mom sticking her nose in his business and telling him what to do. For the months that followed, things seemed to be okay between Donna and Ramsey living under the same roof. However, tragedy would strike once again when on July 31st, 2013, 911 received a call to report that the home where Donna and Ramsey were living has caught fire. First responders arrived to the home, which was engulfed in flames. Donna ran outside, letting the firefighters know that Ramsey was still inside and in the basement and they needed to go get him. Thankfully, firefighters were able to recover Ramsey from the home, but at the time, it was clear that Ramsey was not in the right headspace. He was sort of out of it, not really making much sense when he talked. Donna informed first responders that he was on Xanax at the time for his mental health, so that could explain why he didn't seem right. When fire investigators later looked into the fire, they determined that it was started in the basement, most likely by accident. They thought that it was possible that there were some rags placed right by the hot water heater, so maybe that is what caught fire. They couldn't be sure, but they thought this was the most likely scenario. After this fire, the home was no longer livable, so Ramsey and Donna moved out and moved into Ramsey's condo together. After that, months passed and nothing really extreme or significant happened. According to neighbors, though, Ramsey and Donna were pretty much constantly fighting. Ramsey would sometimes vent to neighbors about things they were arguing about, Donna would call her other son, Jason, who lived out of state at the time, to complain about the issues that they were facing at home. At one point, Jason did suggest that maybe Donna should just give up her guardianship status, but she wouldn't. So, they just continued on arguing and living like an old married couple. However, by January 27th, 2014, Donna arrived to the local police station to inform them that her son, 32-year-old Ramsey was missing. She said that a day or two prior, he left the home to go on a walk. She saw him walking towards the 7-Eleven, but he never returned home. At first, she wasn't all that worried because she thought that maybe he was just out and went to see a friend or something like that. But when days passed and he still didn't return, she became concerned for his safety. After all, it was very cold at the time, winter in Michigan is going to be absolutely freezing, and when he left, all he was wearing was his Carhartt jacket, a t-shirt, some flannel pajama bottoms, and some boots. She said that she's tried calling him numerous times, but was getting no response back. The first thing officers did to look for Ramsey was to ping his cell phone, but they got nothing from that. They then went out and started looking around the area and began interviewing those who knew Ramsey. Many friends who spoke with detectives said that it was possible that Ramsey just left the home because he got tired of living with Donna. They told police of several friends' houses where he could be staying, so of course, police followed up with those friends, 
but still no one had seen him or knew where he could be. By January 29th, police were able to get a hold of Ramsey's cell phone records to see who he had been in contact with in the days and weeks leading to his disappearance. They found that numerous family members had been repeatedly calling him, but the thing that really jumped out to them was that Donna actually had not been trying to get into contact with Ramsey. There were absolutely no calls from her to Ramsey's number in the days after his disappearance. This really stood out to investigators because Donna told them that she had been calling him repeatedly to try to get a hold of him after his disappearance, but the records showed that she literally did not call him a single time. So, police reached out to Donna and mentioned that they want to talk about Ramsey's cell phone records, but by that point, Donna was no longer being cooperative and was no longer returning their calls. After three days of looking for Ramsey and finding pretty much no evidence that could point to where he went, something massive was found. In an area about 50 miles north of St. Clair Shores, police discovered multiple trash bags scattered all along several hundred yards along Allington Road near the Fred Moore exit off Interstate 94. Initially, the person who discovered these bags thought that they looked to have animal remains inside, but as they looked closer, they found that it appeared to be human body parts within those bags. In the first garbage bag found by investigators, there appeared to be a human foot sticking out. As they went along the road, they just kept finding more and more trash bags, all of which contained various human body parts. In the second bag, they found a lower abdomen, pelvic area, and attached thighs. The next bag had a left arm, a right leg from the knee down, and a left thigh. Another bag contained a torso, which had been bisected. Another bag had a human head, a right thigh, and a left lower leg. Due to the extreme weather and high winds, some of the bags had flown open and body parts were falling out of them. One of the bags was flapping open because it was stuck to a branch. While some bags were right along the gravel road, some of them had rolled into the fields and onto the roads because of how strong the winds had been. In total, they found six garbage bags, all which contained human remains. Then, they found an additional two bags. One had five jigsaw blades and nine unused matches, several half-burned matches, and plastic packaging for the saw blades. Another had a woman's sweater, jogging pants, burnt-up gloves and socks, a melted plastic bag, a terry cloth, and a box for a saw. At first, after making this horrific discovery, investigators didn't know if the remains belonged to multiple people or just one person. After taking the bags back to the medical examiner's lab and examining them all together, though, they realized that the body belonged to one person who had been dismembered and cut into 12 pieces. They had recovered all of the body parts except for the right arm, which I don't know if it's ever been recovered to this day. But after examining the body, it turned out that it belonged to 32-year-old Ramsey Scrivo, of course, the fact that he had been cut up and dumped in numerous trash bags pointed to the fact that this had to have been murder. But of course, they did still complete an autopsy on Ramsey and they were able to determine a cause of death. It was found that the head and neck appeared to have some burning and charring. There was also evidence of blunt force trauma to the head and shoulders, and there were ligature marks to the neck as well. The medical examiner found that Ramsey had several prescription drugs in his system, all of which had been prescribed to him for symptoms of psychosis and anxiety. However, they found that he had extremely large amounts of one of these drugs in his system, Xanax. The official cause of death was determined to be asphyxia, meaning that he was strangled to death. Due to this and the large amount of Xanax in his system, the medical examiner believed that he was drugged before his death and then strangled to finish him off. His killer then put his body into the bathtub and used a saw to dismember the body very carefully and precisely. At one point, there was also an attempt to burn the body in that bathtub, but it mostly just charred up parts of the body rather than burning it completely. At this point, as police were making these discoveries and realizing that Ramsey had been killed, they called Donna to notify her. 
Like I mentioned earlier, she had been ignoring all of these calls for a few days, but after the news came out about a dismembered body being found, Donna did start answering. They, of course, told her the news about her son being found, and she was devastated. She told them that when she saw on the news that a body had been found, she had a horrible feeling that it might have been Ramsey. Police then asked her if Ramsey knew anybody up in that area where his body had been found, and she said she didn't know of anyone he knew. She said that she didn't know anyone up there either. Neither her or Ramsey had any reason to be up in that area. She was adamant that she had not visited that area at any point. But by that point, police had already been investigating the area, looking at CCTV footage, and speaking with witnesses. They now knew that Donna was lying to them. They knew that Donna was in that area. In fact, she was seen in pretty much the exact area where Ramsey's remains were located, like on that street. First, police heard from a cashier who worked at a local BP gas station located off the Fred Moore exit off I-94. This cashier said that at around 2.30 p.m. on January 30th, she noticed a woman who went up to the counter and bought gas. The woman appeared frustrated and their conversation was very limited. She just handed the cashier some money and left in a hurry. Police then went and checked the CCTV footage from the gas station and it showed a Caucasian woman with brownish white hair, but the video was grainy and not the best quality, so they couldn't concretely identify the woman at that time. Then, police received another tip from a teenage boy who said that he was driving down the road near the Fred Moore exit when he saw a woman driving a silver SUV, getting out of the car, and then discarding a bag. The woman was white with long brown hair. He said that he saw the woman shake the bag and it looked like a dead dog fell from the bag. This obviously stood out to the boy who wondered why anyone would be dumping a dead dog on the road like that. Both of these sightings were obviously concerning. The descriptions both matched Donna, who claimed she wasn't in that area, and police truly believed that it was her on that CCTV footage. Now, like I mentioned earlier, in one of those bags, detectives noticed several jigsaw blades. Using the model number on those blades, they were able to track down where they were purchased from. This led detectives to a Lowe's store in Harper Woods, which is just outside of St. Clair Shores. At the time, police did find a witness who had an interesting story to share. The witness was a store manager who said that at around 8 p.m. on January 27th, she was met with a woman who was returning a jigsaw that she had purchased that same morning. She said that the woman stopped her as she was walking into the store and the two had a very brief interaction. The woman seemed flustered and urgent, telling the worker that the saw wasn't working, it wouldn't keep a charge. She was very persistent, saying that she needed help right that second. The witness did help the woman who bought a new 7.2 volt power jigsaw after returning the old one. The woman was described as being an older woman with long brown and white hair. After looking on the CCTV footage from that store, police saw a woman who did appear to be Donna. Police also spoke with neighbors of Ramsey's and Donna's, and they said that they last saw Ramsey on January 24th. They said that sometime either on the 29th or 30th, they then saw Donna struggling under the weight of these large garbage bags as she loaded them into her silver SUV. Another neighbor said that on multiple occasions between the dates of January 25th and the 30th, she heard loud sounds of what she thought sounded like a saw being used. She also smelled a very strong odor of bleach and other chemicals coming from the condo around the same time that the saw was heard. It was also found that on the same day that she was apparently seen dumping those garbage bags, Donna donated both of the vehicles she owned. She didn't sell them, she didn't get any money for these cars, she straight up just donated both of her cars, completely getting rid of them, including her silver SUV. Of course, after confirming that the body was Ramsey, hearing from all of these witnesses, and seeing a woman who looked just like Donna in that CCTV footage, police knew they needed to locate her and speak with her in person, which they did that same day. They asked her again if she had been in that area, and she continued to deny it, 
but then they showed her an image of her on that surveillance footage telling her that this woman certainly looks just like her. And it was after seeing the image that she suddenly realized that maybe she was in the area. She said that she must have gotten gas there when she was out looking for her son. It was such an insignificant stop in the panicked search for her son that she just forgot about it. But by that time, police really felt that Donna was most likely the one who murdered her own son. So they kept pushing her, trying to get her to talk, but she just kept denying having anything to do with it, and then she requested a lawyer. As Donna was in the station speaking with officers, they had also been granted a search warrant to search Ramsey's condo. Officers executing the warrant said that as soon as they stepped in, they smelled an overwhelming scent of bleach. Throughout the home, they found a trail of what looked like very small spots of blood that led from the bathtub to Ramsey's bedroom. There was also bleach stains all over the carpet. Of course, this led investigators to believe that someone had used bleach to clean up blood within that home. At the time, police also found Ramsey's Xanax prescription bottle. Using the date of when the medication was prescribed and knowing the dosage of what was supposed to be taken, investigators deduced that there were an extra 10 pills missing from that bottle. Once again, we know that Ramsey had a very large amount of Xanax in his system at the time of his death, so this indicates that he may have taken 10 extra pills before his death, whether voluntarily or involuntarily. Based on all of this information, police felt like they had enough to arrest and charge Donna with the dismemberment of her son, but at first, she was not charged with the murder. They really only had evidence at that point that she dismembered and dumped the body. At her bail hearing, she pleaded not guilty and was given a $250,000 bail. She was unable to post her bail, so she remained in jail as the investigation continued. As Donna was awaiting her trial in jail, she made a call to her sister, which had been recorded. In the call, Donna told her sister a whole new explanation for what happened to her son. She said that on January 24th, she was in the basement doing laundry. When she went upstairs into Ramsey's room, she found that he was lying unconscious on the floor. As she saw this, she said that a man dressed in all black from head to toe, wearing a ski mask, started walking towards her. The man told Donna that he had just killed Ramsey and said that if she didn't do exactly as he said, he was going to kill her other son too. The man had a gun and so she was so scared of what he would do, so she complied. Over the days that followed, the man directed her and told her what to do. He told her to go shopping, telling her exactly what to buy. So she went out and bought the saw. She said that she did try to go to the police station to alert them to what was happening, but when she went there, the man was already at the station waiting for her. I'm only laughing because this story is just, it's so ridiculous and it gets even more ridiculous from here. After she bought that saw, the man then used it to dismember Ramsey. He was then the one who put the body parts into the bags. He then forced Donna to load them into her SUV and told her to dump them. She did just that, and finally, after doing what she was told, the man left her alone. But before he left, he said that if she told anyone or contacted the police, he was going to kill her and the rest of the family. He didn't think to kill her then, he didn't think to do anything else then other than threaten her after forcing her to do all of these things crazy craziness. It's just so crazy that he just left a witness like this, let her basically watch him dismember a body, admitted to her right away that he killed her son. All of this and the guy just left. He threatened her, but he just left. Of course, this is just the most ridiculous story. This might be one of the most ridiculous stories I've actually ever heard. But at this point, the prosecution knew that she was going to try and use this story at the trial, so they needed to go back and make sure all of their evidence was solid. They spoke with all of these witnesses, including her neighbors, and every single one said that they saw Donna and only Donna. When she was loading those bags into her car, there was no masked man hiding in the car. When she was seen dumping the bags, only she was in that car. 
at the gas station, she was the only one there. Once again, no masked man hiding in the shadows. There was absolutely zero evidence to show that anyone except Donna was involved. And honestly, if you ask me, I think it's really funny that Donna only did the things that she was seen doing. Everything else that she knew wasn't caught on camera was the masked man. The masked man killed Ramsey. He's actually the one that dismembered him. Everything that was done in the privacy of her home was done by this masked man, but everything she was seen doing, she admitted that she did it, but she was forced to do it. And at no point did this masked man think to come with her to make sure she did it. At no point did he come with her to make sure this wasn't reported because she could have gone to the police at any time, but I guess he was following her. This does not have to be said, but there's no reports at the police station that a masked man was hanging around anywhere. Obviously, this entire thing was completely made up. At this point, police had enough evidence to show that she was the one who dismembered her son and dumped his body. Obviously, it can be reasonably deduced that she killed him too. There's not going to be any way that someone else killed Ramsey and she just decided to dismember him for whatever reason, but making this argument that she killed him would be much easier if they knew a motive. One thing that stood out to investigators was something they found on Donna's cell phone. Now, like I mentioned earlier, Donna was originally from Texas. Officers found out that a few months before Daniel passed away, Donna attended a high school reunion back in Texas. After this reunion, when Donna returned back to Michigan, Donna started texting back and forth with a man with whom she had a relationship back in high school. The two had even talked about her returning back to Texas to be with him, but of course, she couldn't. She had a husband at the time. Finding these messages was huge. It truly put this whole case together and painted a picture of what possibly could have been going on from the very, very beginning. Based on this information, it's possible that after Daniel was transitioned to palliative care, Donna took that as an opportunity to get him out of the picture. It's possible that she did give him that morphine, causing him to die. I do want to note that Daniel's body was cremated, so even though there was this missing morphine, there was a little bit of a question on how he died, and Ramsey accused his mother of killing Daniel, it was never investigated, there was no autopsy done, so there's no way to prove this, and to this day, there's no way we could know for sure. After Daniel's death, it's also possible that she purposely blamed Ramsey for stealing the morphine as a way to show the courts that Ramsey is unstable and mentally unwell. It's possible that she took guardianship of him as a way to control him and try to force him to move to Texas with her. But according to neighbors, once again, him and Donna were constantly fighting and arguing. It's possible that during this time, Donna was trying to get Ramsey to move with her, but he was refusing. Maybe after months of fighting and Donna not getting her way, she set her house on fire to either kill Ramsey or use it as a way to further exert her control over him. But when he was saved and the two moved into his condo, the fighting and disagreements continued, nothing improved. So finally, by January 24th or 25th, 2014, Donna decided to drug her son with enough Xanax to render him defenseless. Once he was knocked out, she strangled him until he died. She then cut his body up over the course of five days, trying to burn it as well before ultimately deciding to dispose of him along an off-road in a town 50 miles north of where she was living. Of course, this is all just a theory for why she might have wanted to kill her son. I will get more into what was said about all of this once we get into the trial in just a few minutes. Either way, after putting together this story, police finally felt like they had enough to charge Donna with capital murder. Of course, she pleaded not guilty. By May of 2015, almost a year and a half after the murder of her son, Ramsey Scrivo, Donna's trial for murder started. The prosecution outlined all of the evidence that I've told you up to this point, the fact that Donna reported her son missing, but there was no attempt to contact him despite her claims that she called him multiple times. Her saying that she was never in the area where the body was found, despite CCTV showing the contrary. This showed that she lied to the police multiple times. 
I also want to note that when the medical examiner was testifying about the body found in all of those different bags, the condition of the various body parts, the fact that some of them had been burned, speaking about the cause of death, Donna showed no emotion through all of it. She didn't seem surprised, shocked, sad, nothing. She just sat there. They brought forward the witnesses that we've discussed up to this point who talked about what they saw in the days before and after the disappearance. Other witnesses came forward to speak on Donna's character. Multiple witnesses said that Donna was known to be overbearing and controlling all throughout her life. Many people said that yes, Ramsey had mental health issues he had ever since he was a teenager, but many people said that Ramsey never appeared suicidal even after his father's death. Many people said that his mental health never seemed bad enough to warrant Donna being his caregiver. To a lot of family members and friends who knew them, this appeared to be another way to exert her control over Ramsey. And again, they brought up the text messages from her phone showing that she was trying to move back to Texas after reconnecting with an old flame. However, even though they found these text messages that showed she did want to move back to Texas, there was never really a solid motive for this. There wasn't anything to show that she wanted to move so badly that she would have killed her husband, set her house on fire, and then murder and dismember her son. She could have left her son in Michigan while she moved. Her other son moved out of state and wouldn't have moved with her either. So why all of this just to get Ramsey to move with her? To me, it doesn't really make sense. Then to defile her son to the extent that she did, she carefully chopped him up over the course of multiple days, getting real intimate with his dead body and having to repeatedly look at her dead son while dismembering him. That is a next level kind of messed up. It's one thing to kill your son in the heat of an argument, you know, arguing about moving to Texas, him preventing her from doing what she wants with her life. It's another to dismember a body. The amount of time and effort that takes is just next level disturbing. But still, even though there's not a solid motive, all of the evidence points directly at Donna as being the one who murdered and dismembered her son, regardless of what the motive could have been. She is the only one that was present at that time. She is the only one who possibly could have done it. On the other hand, the defense stuck with the masked man story. Donna testified in her own defense, telling the story to everyone in the courtroom about how she found her son dead and was forced to dispose of his body. When asked why she didn't tell anyone about this when she was by herself at the store and at the gas station and all of these different places, or even after he left her, she said that she was afraid that the masked man was going to kill her and her family if he found out she told. Other witnesses for the defense spoke on Donna's character, all saying that she was a loving, doting mother. She was dealing with a psychotic son who lashed out and became angry and violent, yet still she loved and cared for him so much that she became his legal guardian to make sure he was okay. Again, there was no motive. The defense said that there was nothing to show that she ever had any reason to kill her son. They also pointed out that Ramsey is a very big dude, which is absolutely true. Meanwhile, Donna is only 110 pounds, 60 years old, not someone who would be strong enough to drag a body to the bathtub, cut him up, and then dispose of his body. But at the same time, her cutting up Ramsey could actually explain all of this. Again, she was small. She would not have been able to dispose of a full body. No way she could have lifted up the entire body and put it into her car to dispose of it. Therefore, it actually makes sense that she would cut him up to make him easier to dump. She could have dragged him little by little over the course of a couple hours, getting him into the bathroom. I feel like that's absolutely possible no matter how strong you are. Dragging someone is going to be very hard, but once the body is in smaller pieces, it makes sense that she would be able to carry them to her car to then get rid of them. The defense also said that there was no DNA on the saws, no obvious blood evidence at the home besides those little drops of blood they found, no fingerprints, so nothing to show that she actually handled his body after his death, 
before they were put into the plastic bags. But if I didn't say it before, the masked man theory makes no sense. No way a man who just murdered someone would stick around and force a woman to buy enough supplies to dismember a body. The masked man had no reason to dismember a body like that, let alone forcing someone else to do it, giving her the freedom to leave the house on her own and buy a saw and stop for gas. All of those times, she easily could have told someone. If it really were a masked man, instead of going through all this trouble, he would have just killed Donna too or left before she caught him. So, you all know that all of this story is absolute BS, but again, that is the story that Donna was apparently sticking with. At the end of the trial, both sides made their closing arguments and the jury was sent off for deliberations. They actually deliberated for less than an hour before coming back with their verdict. They found that 61-year-old Donna Scrivo was guilty for the first-degree murder and dismemberment of her son, 32-year-old Ramsey Scrivo. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been told that you have reached a verdict. Who will speak for you? Madam Foreperson, would you please stand and uh, render your verdict? You may read from the verdict form if you wish. Count one, first degree murder of Ramsey Scrivo, guilty of first degree murder. Count two, dead bodies, disinternment and mutilation, guilty of disinternment and mutilation of a dead body. Count three, dead bodies removing without medical examiner permission, guilty of removing, removing a dead body without medical examiner permission. At her sentencing hearing, Donna continued to proclaim her innocence. She ranted and raved about how she had nothing to do with her son's death. But the judge addressed Donna, saying that she committed one of the most horrific, brutal, violent crimes that he has ever dealt with in his years as a judge, and to her son, no less. This whole case was such a shock and devastation to the whole community, and the fact that a mother can do this to her own son is just unthinkable. For her crimes, Donna Scrivo was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Even to this day, Donna maintains her innocence. After she was sentenced, she continued telling the judge that he was wrong and that she was not the one who murdered her son. She filed appeals and continues fighting the verdict and sentence, but of course, she remains behind bars to this day. As I've been mentioning all throughout this video, one of the biggest things about this case is the fact that there wasn't really a solid motive. We don't know exactly why she did what she did. We can guess. We can say that maybe it was so she could move to Texas, but again, Ramsey was a full-grown adult. I don't know if I think she killed her husband, but after knowing what we know now, I absolutely would not put it past her. When she blamed Ramsey for taking that missing file, I think it shows that she is controlling, manipulative, and uses everyone around her to get what she wants. But with that being said, when she did have her husband out of the way, she could have moved to Texas. She could have given up guardianship. She didn't need Ramsey to come with her. According to what we heard from others, it didn't seem like Ramsey wanted his mom around all the time. So it's not like he was constantly begging her not to go and making it hard for her to leave. She could have given up her guardianship and left if she wanted to, but that's not what she did. So truly, at the end of all of this, I don't think we have a solid answer for why she did this, and I don't think we ever will. But with all of that being said, I really want to know what you all think. Do you think Donna is guilty? Do you think she killed both her husband and son? Do you think she set her house on fire? And then when it comes to Ramsey, why do you think she killed him? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell too on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and Spotify. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.